my talk is titled German Neo-Expressionism and Subcultural Style, and I will just dive right in. From the late 1970s to the 1980s, expressive painting returned to prominence. This was a surprising twist following the industrial aesthetics of minimalism and pop, as critics regularly remarked. A 1982 article in Der Spiegel marveled at the Sturmflut der Bilder, remarking, quote, whereas until very recently, an art of highly sparse forms and strict thinking evoked respect, if an occasional yawn, now a new painting is spreading like rabies, which would rather be labeled with anything other than discipline and coherent theory." End quote. Nor was the trend limited to Europe. In a 1981 New York Times article boldly titled Expressionism Returns to Painting, Hilton Kramer wrote, quote, instead of leaving everything out of painting and making a neat, clean, perfect form of what remains, these are painters who are determined to put everything in. Uh, there is no desire in this art to make it look as if it had been executed by expert technicians following the specifications of a blueprint." End quote. Although neo-expressionist painters cropped up on both sides of the Atlantic, the return of figuration involved a geopolitical reorientation. The critical and market success of Western European artists was something of an upset in a world that had been dominated by the United States since the rise of abstract expressionism. The return to cultural power of countries from the former axis of evil, specifically Germany and Italy, resurrected the specter of fascism for some US critics. To see neo-expressionism as a harbinger of neo-fascism meant seeing it not just as a national style, but as a nationalist style, one that created a cultural, political, cultural and political bridge between the 1930s to 40s and the 1970s to 80s. While such polemics had their purpose, they obscured important differences among the various Western European artists who had found new international success. For example, German painters of an earlier generation, such as Georg Baselitz and Markus Lüppertz, were parceled together with younger artists, such as Rainer Fetting, under the term German neo-expressionism, primarily because they entered the US market at the same time. This elided important differences between the older and younger artists, especially vis-a-vis -vis contemporary youth culture. There is much to learn by analyze, analyzing German neo-expressionism in less sweeping terms. Changes in the structure and meaning of youth culture is indeed one of the main historical developments that complicate the relation between neo-expressionism and previous expressionist movements. Hilton Kramer was less impressed by the contrast between the hot art of the neo-expressionists and the cool art of the 1960s than by the fact that, uh, quote, this, um, this hottest of decades, the 1960s, was adamant in favoring the coolest of art styles. He explains, the experience of the 60s and the changes it affected in family life and the relation of the sexes and clothes and work and education and religion caused great havoc in a great many lives, yet the trauma brought about by these profound changes was more or less declared off limits as far as painting was concerned. It was in the attempt to relieve and resolve this tension that the neo-expressionist movement was born." End quote. From this perspective, neo-expressionism can be seen as a belated symptom of the countercultural movements of the previous decade. In contrast, Craig Owen saw neo-expressionism as the betrayal of 60s countercultures, casting it rather as the aesthetic corollary of the neo-conservative politics of the Reagan era. Quote, over the past few years, we have witnessed a massive retreat from politics and back into the psyche. Although this phenomenon requires art historical, psychoanalytic, and economic analysis, it must ultimately be seen as a backlash against the 60s counterculture that motivates the neoconservative platform for the economic and spiritual renewal of the US." End quote. References to US politics aside, Owens's complaint of, ret of a retreat from politics back into the psyche, a retreat from public to private, was echoed by many European critics of neo-expressionism who saw it as a revival of the myth of the artist's genius bent on expressing an inner truth rather than reflecting on issues in the world at large. The question remains whether this retreat from politics was necessarily a retreat to the private individual. I believe that despite Kramer and Owens' seeming antagonism regarding the relation between neo-expressionism and the counterculture, they are both right in a way 
Neo-expressionism was both a symptom and a betrayal of the countercultural movement. To be precise, neo-expressionism reflects the shift from counterculture to subculture. As scholars such as Stuart Hall and Dick Hebdige have articulated, countercultures are more explicitly opposed to the political and ideological structure of society, while subcultures displace this opposition into symbolic forms of resistance, such as fashion and lifestyle, without disrupting the divisions between work, home, family, school, and leisure. This shift can indeed be described as a shift from politics to the psyche, but it is not therefore a shift from the collective to the individual. The interiority of the subculture is eminently collective, and that's precisely the issue. For to see one's membership in a subculture as a consequence of one's inner nature is to obscure the ways in which subcultural style is historically grounded. In my research, I focus on three artists. Rainer Fetting, Salome, born Wolfgang Ludwig Zillard, and Luciano Castelli, friends and in some cases lovers, who painted both independently and collectively in addition to collaborating on performances, photo shoots, Super 8 films, and new wave music. In 1977, they co-founded the Galerie am Moritzplatz along with Helmut Bittendorf, Bernd Zimmer, and Stefan Roloff, a fact that resulted in them being called the Moritz Boys. Uh, given their humble origins in what was often called the Selbsthilfe Galerie, or self-help gallery, their work quickly achieved surprising critical and market success as part of a movement of gestural painting dubbed Neue Wilde. Part of this success, I argue, was due to the mystique associated with their subcultural activities in West Berlin. Specifically, the work of Fetting, Salome, and Castelli referenced queer subcultures through motifs such as gay saunas, nightclubs, BDSM scenes, and cross-dressing or drag performances. This also distinguishes their work from other German neo-expressionists whose bohemianism tended to be more hetero and macho. The network around the Moritz boys threaded between the art world, the underground or DIY scene, and West Berlin nightlife. For example, before moving to Germany, Luciano Castelli took part in the groundbreaking exhibition Transformer, Aspects of Travesty, curated by Jean-Christophe Amann at the Kunstmuseum Luzern in 1974. When Castelli moved to Berlin, he stayed at the loft of DIY fashion designer Claudia Skoda, which was known as Fabrique Neu, and worked for her as a photographer. It was through Skoda that Castelli met Salome, though Salome was already familiar with Castelli's work because of the catalog of the Transformer exhibition, a major influence on Salome's decision to take up art in the first place. Skoda knew Salome from nightlife, since he worked as a bartender at the gay bar Andres Ufa, um, which was notorious for having plate glass windows instead of a dark doorway with a, spe uh, with a speakeasy or peephole. Later, Salome worked at the bar at the dance club Dschungel, now legendary as a meeting place for local and international stars such as Nick Cave, Omi Haag, Iggy Pop, David Bowie, Grace Jones, etc. As a bartender, Salome was known for what he called his exotic outfits, many of which incorporated pieces by Skoda. When Salome and Castelli met, they immediately hit it off. Salome taught Castelli painting, and Castelli taught Salome photography. A photograph from one of their spontaneous studio sessions featuring the two hanging from a tightrope, clad only in thongs, caught the eye of Skoda, who took it as inspiration for her 1979 fashion show titled Big Birds. And after Salome and Castelli started to make music together under the moniker Geile Tiere, Skoda put them in touch with Manuel Götzing, a pioneer of the Berliner Schule of Electronic Music, who had recorded and mixed Skoda's one and only album, Die Dominas, from 1981. While the Neue Wilde were by no means the first group of artists to be associated with a subculture, this association took on a distinctly different valence around the 1970s and 80s, along with the shifting fortunes of the discourse of subcultures. Where previous subcultures were primarily understood negatively in their deviance from a reified mainstream, around the 1970s and 80s, subcultures began to be studied and appreciated for their own particular sociological character. The rise of subculture studies paralleled a more widespread interest in subcultures among the general public and within popular media. Analyzing German neo-expressionism in the light of contemporaneous subcultures therefore distinguishes it in important ways from the abstract expressionism of the 1940s as well as early 20th century expressionism. It serves to mark neo-expressionism as a distinctly postmodern phenomenon, one whose ideological context had more to do with pluralism and multiculturalism 
than anti-communism, democratic freedom, or colonialism. Critiques of German neo-expressionism usually argue, I have a blank slide here. Critiques of German neo-expressionism usually argue that it attempted to revitalize the myth of individual artistic genius and national culture. For the Moritz boys, however, the opposite holds true. They emphasized collective artistic production and extolled subculture over national culture. The Moritz boys were concerned less with developing strictly individualistic signatures than in recovering a sense of authenticity grounded in collective experience, uh, in collective expression. Their collaborative and collective practices were an attempt to develop a distributed trans-individual authorship that would provide a sense of authentic cultural activity in the face of postmodern fragmentation and alienation. In arguing that the familiar accounts of German neo-expressionism are wrong, I do not mean to imply that these artists were actually progressive. Rather, I want to clarify the nature of their regression, using this insight to challenge some problematic ways of thinking about subcultural style. Specifically, I argue that the notion of subcultural style as an expression of one's inner nature reproduces a classic primitivist trope. One of the main primitivist fantasies undergirding European modernism was the idea that primitive art is more authentic and holistic than art produced under the alienated conditions of industrial capitalism. This fantasy is the hinge connecting the primitivist imagery favored by the Neue Wilde with their subcultural activities. This new perspective on the primitivism of the Neue Wilde reveals it to be more than simply a problem of subject matter and opens onto broader questions about how subcultures can be canonized and archived without resorting to an essentialist understanding of subcultural style. Oh, I guess I'm one behind. Sorry about that. Um, the phrase Neue Wilde was coined by Wolfgang, Be Wolfgang Becker as part of the title for a group show in 1980 at the Sammlung Ludwig in Aachen, Germany, now known as the Ludwig Forum, for which he was the chief curator. Les Nouveaux Fauves, Die Neuen Wilden, brought together a wide range of artists from Germany, France, and the US, all of whom were presumed to display an affinity for early 20th century expressionism. The German plural noun, Wilden, was meant to translate the French Fauves, meaning wild beasts. The term fauve was first used in 1905 to disparage certain French post-impressionist painters such as André Derain and Henri Matisse for their apparently bestial style, but it was later embraced by the artists themselves. However, unlike the word fauve, the German word wilden more commonly refers to wild humans, that is, savages. The translation therefore makes explicit the primitivism that was al always associated with early 20th century expressionism. In art criticism, the term quickly morphed into Neue Wilde, which narrowed its meaning to the art movement and subtly abstracted its association with savagery. Nevertheless, primitivism remained a distinguishing feature of much German neo-expressionism. Though the artists I am focusing on were not included in Becker's exhibition, they nevertheless became three of the most prominent painters associated with the term Neue Wilde. Their suitability to the term is reflected in the fact that their particular brand of neo-expressionism captured its primitivist essence most profoundly. The importance of primitivism in the development of modernist art is well-trodden ground. Traditional art practices of non-European peoples, especially pre-Columbian art from South America, West and Central African sculpture, and Polynesian art provided European modernists with alternatives to European classicism and naturalism. The modernist interest in folk art and indigenous art was part of a more general reinterpretation of the meaning and character of such art among anthropologists and art historians. In 19th century art history, indigenous art was seen as a rudimentary form that had long been surpassed by civilized, that is, European culture. The very term primitive collapsed the notion of simplicity of form with the idea of an origin or beginning, suggesting that indigenous art was stuck in prehistory. Uh, the German ethnologist Leo Frobenius thus wrote, quote, the most primitive no longer exist, but there is a series of lower peoples that allow us to conclude what preceded them on the lowest levels. The primitive hunting peoples in Australia, America, and Africa offer good material, end quote. In articulating the distinction between lower and higher peoples, 19th century ethnologists and art historians supported the colonial project by providing justification for the European right to rule. Primitive people were thought to be slaves to their passions, while Europeans were uniquely capable of abstract thinking. Here, for example, is Susanna Leib on Johann Gottfried Herder. Quote, for the art and culture of non-European societies, 
Herder's humanist teleology entailed a relative recognition of their various cultures, but only as a lower possibility of the human. In Herder, we find a negative correlation between sensual perception and a capacity for abstraction. That means the more sensual people were considered, uh, the more sensual people were considered, the lower their capacity for abstraction were supposed to be, as it was the case with wild people and animals, end quote. For art historians, naturalistic art was taken as the formal correlate for rational thinking. Indigenous art was dismissed as a laughable failure to accurately depict the world, and therefore as incontrovertible proof of the artist's inferiority in comparison with Europeans. However, around 1900, new studies countered that indigenous art was not simply a failed attempt at mimesis, but that it followed an aesthetic logic of its own that could be quite sophisticated. For example, Wilhelm Woringer's Abstraction and Empathy, first published in 1908, described the stylization in, indig in, in indigenous art not as a failure to achieve naturalistic representation, but as a holistic form of representation, blending the outside world and the inside world. Here was a new notion of abstraction that was not in opposition to the sensual, but rather served as its most direct expression. This idea was highly appreciated by German expressionist artists who saw Woringer's work, work as a justification for their own forays into artistic abstraction. Despite scholars' assertions that indigenous art manifested a high degree of formal sophistication and aesthetic intentionality, the idea that this art was somehow more direct and unmediated continued to provoke belittling associations of non-European artists with children or animals. Uh, European modernists who drew on this art for inspiration were at times ridiculed for the desire to willingly give up the comforts of civilized life and go native. This caricature of the Fauves by Robert Chandler is a good example. It was made in 1913 in response to the International Exhibition of Modern Art in New York, known as the Armory Show, which included French post-impressionist and Fauvist art, which had rarely been seen in the States before then. The Fauves are depicted as living in nature and apprenticing themselves to apes. The caricature depicts recognizable artists surrounded by identifiable artworks. For example, the artist kneeling in the right foreground is Paul Gauguin, and his 1898 canvas, Fa i Hei Hei, is visible in the lower right corner. Indeed, one of the apes appears to be responsible for the oeuvre of Matisse. While the Fauves may not have recognized themselves in this portrayal, they nevertheless reinforced its basic assumptions. Gauguin definitely saw himself as giving up civilization and becoming a savage, a journey that led him first to Brittany in northern France and eventually to France's Polynesian colonies. Shortly after his arrival in Tahiti, he set out to cut rosewood, an event he describes in his diary thus, quote, felling gives me pleasure, and with true pleasure and joyful excitement in me, in an attempt to satisfy, I don't know what, divine raw desire, I tore my hands bloody. I didn't hack at the tree, that's not what I wanted to overpower. What my axe told me in time with the echoing blows was this, you must strike down the whole forest, destroy the whole forest of evil which blew its germs into you with poisonous breath. Yes, from now on the old culture man is dead, gone. I was born again, or rather another man, purer, stronger, arose in me. This terrible seizure was the last farewell to civilization. From now on, I was another man, a true savage." End quote. This passage demonstrates not only Gauguin's desire to shed the fetters of an alienating civilization and return to a primitive state, it shows how this desire was characterized as a liberating expression of pleasure, excitement, and sensuality. This is the spirit he carries over into the wood carvings and paintings he produced in Tahiti. Fa i Heihe re represents a fertile pastoral paradise with scantily clad natives harmoniously blending with the natural world of plants and animals. More like a decorative frieze than a traditional landscape painting, it, es it eschews naturalism in favor of an ornamental play of form and color. The sensual and the abstract approach one another, presaging their fusion in expressionism. In his striving to regain paradise lost, Gauguin casts himself as a lonely and heroic figure. It is no accident that Victor Segalen titles his obituary for Gauguin, The Last Man. In the shift from expressionism to neo-expressionism, this trope gets left behind. As art critic Wolfgang Max Faust put it, compared to, the, quote, compared to their models, the better known of which, other than the expressionists are Paul Gauguin, Vincent van Gogh, and Edvard Munch, 
These young foves cannot be said to be lonely, for they belong to an alternative scene, to a subculture whose turf is as much New York as Berlin." End quote. Paradise was no longer to be found in a primeval forest, but in a garage in the West Village. The primitivism of the Neue Wilde must be understood in light of this subcultural context. While the primitive still signifies a more sensual and less individualistic form of cultural production, the artist no longer needs to be set against it as the tragic figurehead of a decadent civilization. I do not mean to suggest that the neo-expressionists succeeded in sublimating the racial fetishism of the expressionists into a more wholesome form. The work of the Neue Wilde is still littered with objectifying portrayals of racialized bodies. As Rudolf Augstein put it in his Spiegel article, quote, Nie hat man so viele gerechte Glieder gemalt gesehen wie jetzt bei den Wilden. Uh, true, some of these cocks are Caucasian, but in keeping with the primitivist tradition, the racialized body, and especially the black body, is superlatively sexualized. Among the Neue Wilde, the racialized body is not simply an object of desire. It symbolizes a more immediate connection with sexuality. This is why queer painters such as Fetting, Salome, and Castelli so often paint themselves in the guise of the racial other. Kea V. Nand argues that the primitivist fantasy of sexual liberation that characterized German expressionism takes on new dimensions for the neo-expressionists in the context of the women's movement and the gay and lesbian rights movement. But this should not be understood as an expression of solidarity across racial lines. Rather, race functions as a symbol of emancipation only because of the primitivist fantasy that imagines the racial other to be more in touch with their sexuality, more capable of expressing their innate sensuality. This way of thinking was not limited to the neo-expressionists, but could be found throughout West German counter and subcultures. Moritz Eger writes, quote, Sometimes, in particular among those who wanted to rid themselves of traditional constraints, black people were taken to embody um, one's personal sexual liberation. One of the crudest testaments of a well-intended yet deeply racist sexual sexualization of blacks within the social world of the blues could be found on a sticker distributed by an ad hoc group named Frauenbefreiungsfront Valerie Solanas, Valerie Solanas Women's Liberation Front, which, now somewhat infamously, contained the following rhyming couplets. Here, countercultural and feminist sensibilities proved very much in tune with mainstream representations, even though in the protagonist's own view, they brought to the surface and transvalorized what was otherwise repressed. We might speculate that they considered this over-the-top stereotyping to be subversive of cultural norms." End quote. Though Ega clearly implies his skepticism that this stereotyping was actually subversive, such thinking persists in the reception of the Neue Wilde. Kea Vinand and Katrin Köppert both invoke queerness to simultaneously justify and dismiss the primitivist imagery of the Neue Wilde. Queerness, with its assumed disruptive and transgressive function, serves to secure queer exoticism from the charge of cultural appropriation, stereotyping, and fetishization. In her analysis of Rainer Fetting, Vinand argues that his public homosexuality makes it clear that his portrayals of people of color are not voyeuristic and objectifying because they involve a reciprocity of desire. Furthermore, Fetting's homosexuality is proof enough for Vinand that his reliance on racial stereotypes could actually be a critique of those stereotypes. Katrin Köppert similarly exonerates the Neue Wilde from the charge of stereotyping. Referring to Fetting and Castelli's paintings depicting themselves as Native Americans, Köppert writes, quote, that which is cited amalgamates to something going beyond the chain of signifiers of the image of the Indian, end quote. I would counter that there is nothing beyond the chain of signifiers. Indeed, queerness slots rather conveniently into the chain of signifiers by serving as the signifier of that beyond. Paradoxically, the queer reading of the Neue Wilde establishes the movement's authenticity by insisting on its inauthenticity. That is, inauthenticity at the level of depiction signifies a deeper authenticity, uninhibited play, the free flowing of desire, unalienated cultural production. This is a notion of authenticity long linked with primitive art, echoing Voringa's argument that indigenous artists repudiate naturalism in favor of a more sensual, holistic form of cultural production. In 1922, German art historian Wilhelm Hausenstein wrote approvingly of primitive art, quote, only lust is the bridge between maker and object. <laughs> 
The root of the shaping hands thrusts itself down into the loins of the figures who squat and kneel. Lust turned into art, that is creative power." End quote. A similar belief undergirds the sexuality of the neo-expressionists. Thus, Klaus Ottmann, writing elliptically of the art of the 1980s, intones, quote, in Bosch's garden of earthly delights, black Negroes and Negresses wear red cherries on their heads, bodies of lust, promise of endless pleasures and sensuality. In the paintings of Rainer Fetting and Salome, naked male bodies, in the shower, in front of the mirror, swimming between water lilies, gymnastics on the high wire, autoerotic gimmicks in Francesco Clemente's drawings, erotic bodies in the polychromy of pleasures, variations, repetitions, dissonances, the outburst of polymorphic sexuality in the stage of innocence, the endless transgression, Rainer Fetting, Francesco Clemente, Salome, are these bodies of desire. Painting is sexuality, sex act." End quote. The racialized bodies in German neo-expressionism only make obvious a more profound primitivism that goes beyond stereotypical imagery and subject matter to a notion of primitive art as authentic, unalienated, and non-individualistic. The Neue Wilde identified with the primitive in order to compensate for a distinctly postmodern feeling of alienation, an identification that resulted paradoxically in self-othering as a form of self-expression. I would like to conclude with some words by Dick Hebdige on subcultural style, which I take as a warning against the sort of queer primitivism I have highlighted here. In a section of his book, Subculture, the Meaning of Style, titled, Okay, it's culture, but is it art? Hebdige writes, quote, if we are to think in formal terms at all, subcultural styles are more usefully regarded as mutations and extensions of existing codes, rather than as the pure expression of creative drives. And above all, they should be seen as meaningful mutations." End quote. What that means for German neo-expressionism is that we must pay attention to how it mutates and extends existing codes of colonialism. What we gain in keeping this in mind is a reconsideration of the potentially conservative and reactionary facets of an understanding of queer aesthetics premised on collective expression. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for this inspiring and very tight. I mean, it, I guess I'm afraid we don't have time for many more questions, um, but obviously I couldn't interrupt you. And thank you for taking me at least also into a scene and world I didn't know much about and very convincing uh, suggestions and um, analysis, analysis of it. Are there any questions, um, comments here in the room? Yeah, there are two even. Could, you tr could we try and make it short questions? Because I'm just looking at the, and I don't know about the organizers, so if yeah. I could get some signs when to you know, finish, finish the panel off. But. Yes, I will be very short. I think it's a fantastic presentation. Thank you so much. I have one comment and one question very briefly. Still, I think you should not use the N word fully but you had to restrict because this is, uh, uh, we, we came to a point where this is not possible anymore. Uh, to use the word, to repeat the word, especially from our positions of whiteness. But uh, I have, uh, uh, otherwise I thought you are very right and you put very clearly this uh, um, a section of uh, how this process of racialization is working. And my question will be, uh, uh, that is, uh, uh, if we think uh, further, it seems that the Noe Wald, this uh, new... Uh, uh, are you listening? Okay, that the new uh, wild, uh, they are uh, actually uh, wanted to have the body, this, uh, uh, what you explain, this sexuality. But I think uh, that uh, uh, if we make a research from today, if we think about the film, for example, Get Out, it's clear that this moved radically to actually having the brain, that means the thoughts of, uh, let's say, the black, uh, black uh, population, black uh, uh, thinkers, black people, and really the, uh, the thoughts and the affection, and not any more just the sexuality. And I would like if you can comment, if you see any kind of things coming after what you explained to us recently in art that actually work on these uh, questions. So, and after, after thoughts or aftermaths. Uh, 
of uh, what you explained to us in the night, what was going on in the 80s and 90s. Uh, thank you very much for that comment and question. Um, I would say, first of all, that you're right about the way white supremacy appropriates not just the bodies, but also the thoughts and interiority of black subjects. Um, I think in the material I spoke about today, it's the reduction of blackness to the body that enables that very appropriation. It's, uh, it serves to, um, to collapse uh, racialized cultural production, non-European cultural production with a sensual bodily expression. And it's that collapse that I feel is problematically reproduced in some discussions of uh, queer subcultural production as also a kind of um, natural expression of an innate uh, nature. And so I think that's a, it's certainly a problem that persists until today. Uh, Get Out is an excellent allegory for, uh, for this issue. And um, yeah, so I don't have much to say except to say, yeah, I do think it's a problem that persists. Um, but I did want to qualify that um, I think the form of appropriation you discussed is already present in this work. Thank you. There's another question. Um, yes, uh, first of all, thank you so much for your presentation. I really liked your examples that you used, and I don't know much about expressionism, but it was very interesting to see um, how embodying the black body was actually displayed in this art. And I actually wanted to hear your thoughts on, um, basically, what you describe is something that uh, happens now, especially in internet culture, um, this inhabiting of black spaces and black bodies, but with a, I guess, commercialized twist. Um, and I see that a lot, especially on newer media. Um, there was this phenomenon a couple of years ago on Instagram where a lot of women um, basically did blackface to, um, yeah, basically um, inhabit black spaces in the sense of black magic and um, a lot of, I guess, you could say positively connotated, um, um, it's kind of hard to describe, but positive. I, I still say it's a form of discrimination, but more in a positive light that we basically put black bodies on a, on a pedestal and still sexualizing them. So I just wanted to hear your thoughts and what you think on um, all these different things you describe, but apply to modern internet culture and how that may be in changed over the years, you know? Uh, also a fantastic point. Um, you do see this in, in contemporary internet culture, uh, also through things like reaction memes and stickers uh, that, you know, little clips or fragments of, you know, videos or imagery of black people is taken for its expressive value, exactly, uh, in order to, um, yeah, buy white people to uh, kind of, um, yeah, uh, as a form of reaction or expression. And uh, I've heard this described as digital black facing. Um, and again, I do think it's part of this longer tradition, also goes back to minstrel shows and ways in which kind of animation and expressivity uh, has been racialized um, and performed by white people uh, in a way that doesn't really risk, that doesn't really threaten their position of kind of social and cultural superiority. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, a play, a playfulness that's allowed to us um, because of our privileges. And, um, and uh, yeah, so again, that, that notion of play and playfulness uh, that uh, I think we need to be careful of how it um, could link up with these histories of uh, yeah, racial exploitation and racial stereotyping. Yeah, thank you so much. There's another question. 
Thank you very much, Thomas. Um, this was wonderful. I'm still thinking about so many things that you're saying, and I'm not entirely sure. This goes a little bit back to the last point that was made, whether I understood you correctly. But are you saying that, say, the very um, the emphasis on the notion of desire and pleasure as transgressive value uh, that we find in Die Neuen Wilden, but that we also find, for example, in queer theory of that time and Georg Kongem and others, um, is always already in the Western context a racialized trope? Um, I'm not sure if I'm willing to make that very strong claim yet. Uh, this is honestly research I'm still working on. And so I can safely say I think that's the case uh, with these painters. Um, you know, that this kind of ludic sexuality that is often celebrated in queerness or queer theory, queer discourse, uh, is linked up in this work with primitivism. I'm not sure if I would go so far as to say it is always linked to primitivism. I think uh, play is too broad a concept uh, to be restricted in that way. Um, nevertheless, the point here is to say that I wanted to make a, a bit of a more precise point about the way this kind of queer play is visualized. Uh, and to say that primitivism can uh, appear not just in, uh, in subject matter, in like the literal representation of black bodies or in you know, uh, aesthetic borrowings from other cultural traditions, but also in the way that the artwork is um, sort of discussed and theorized, uh, that there's a kind of epistemological primitivism, you might say, in the way um, this work has been, uh, has been linked to um, a notion of expression uh, that is rooted in colonial concepts of primitive art. Does that make sense? Thank you. Um, are there any more questions and comments? Because I got a note from the organizers uh, that there's still some time to ask questions, so we're not in a rush. I'm, I'm sorry if I went too long. I actually no, did not well, know. I had no clock. I didn't no, know I'm, how long I'm, it was. Yeah, well, no, I'm sorry that I thought. Uh, oh, okay. We, uh, I kept looking up to rush, see if somebody was like giving me a sign. But, um, well, maybe thank you for I your can, patience. <laughs> I can ask a question because um, I'm interested also uh, subcultures in relation to. Um, safer spaces and identity politics, um, because that seems to be in recent years, um, yeah, a subject that seems to be on the surface of a lot of debates and discussions, at least in the field of gender studies. Um, um, and is there anything you can say in relation to what you said about subcultures and your take on it? That's an interesting question. Um, I haven't thought uh, explicitly about safer space, uh, safe spaces. Um, I suppose one small caveat I would make is to say we must always attend to the ways in which our actions, our social spaces, our ways of thinking about who we are and what we do uh, can never really be separated from these like uh, epistemological inheritances, uh, so that you know to look at the ways racism, colonialism, sexism, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, continue to permeate not just you know um, visual culture, but our ways of thinking, and that that can happen also in a safe space. And this isn't to say that, you know, it's not a pessimistic idea that there's no escape, um, but rather just, I guess, a warning to uh, keep it in mind that, you know, a safe space um, is maybe an ideal that is never fully reached, but has to continually be defended or negotiated uh, in order to, like, work towards a kind of safety that we have not yet attained. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. There's another question from Thanks so much for uh, this talk. I too did not know about this particular German queer school and um, but I 
I did want to ask you about the relationship between these kinds of portraits and the work of Attila Richard Lukash. Do you know their work? His, he, he's a, I, I wrote about him a little bit in The Queer Art of Failure. He's a Canadian-based uh, painter who uses some of the same techniques in his paintings, but centers heroic, almost Nazified images of white skinheads. Mm. And yet the backdrop has a kind of primitivist uh, feel to it and is often like fields of poppies or wild animals or something. Um, so I guess I wanted to think about some of the dynamics in these paintings alongside you know, what Sontag calls the fascination with fascism that then re-emerges in some gay male portraiture, I would say, of the 80s and 90s that is completely fixated on the purely masculine body and its heroic stance and that draws from classical imagery going back to Caravaggio. So is there a way of thinking about the work that you're depicting alongside uh, this sort of fascinating fascism body of work? Uh, certainly. Um, one important distinction is that uh, German neo-expressionism was celebrated in some corners uh, precisely because it was seen as a, uh, a renewed interest in a, a modern art movement that had been vilified by the Nazis. Uh, so German expressionism, you know, which was famously exhibited in the, de de the Degenerate Art Exhibition, etc., despite the fact that an expressionist like Emil Nolde was a card-carrying Nazi, um, there were some who saw this as a return to uh, like a, a better German history. Um, uh, and so, although I'm not familiar with this painter's work, it sounds like maybe they are more aware of, they're more sort of intentionally reproducing this fascist imagery, maybe as a way to challenge uh, its continuation. Uh, after 45. Um, it's not clear whether it's a challenge or whether mm. it's actually a reinvestment of a particular version of masculinity that, if it had been depicted as straight, would have been easily identifiable as fascist and therefore challenged. Yeah. But because it's gay and often features two gay men who are visibly aroused, mm. then it's seen as queer. And this is where queerness is a cover sometimes for imagery that we would object to anywhere else. And I heard yeah. you saying something similar about the school you were examining. Mm. Yeah, I see. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, it seems like it's a different aesthetic that's being kind of celebrated in, under the cover of queerness, but maybe a similar logic nonetheless. Um, and the... Uh, there's of course lots of excellent like scholarship done on the homosocial aspects of fascist masculinity uh, that would maybe provide a good background for this uh, artist's work. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, is there any more question? I can't see any hand in the room. Is there something going on online that we should know about? <laughs> no question there. Well, if that's the case, then thank you so much for your inspiring talk uh, and also for your questions and the conversation, which we will continue, um, hopefully, and we have the privilege to be here and actually be able to um, talk a bit more also during the day. Um, yeah, and good luck with your PhD project. <laughs> you. uh, sounds very fascinating and interesting, and I'm sure we will hear a lot more about you and your work. Thank you so much for being here.